this time on Superstars, five larger-than-life songbirds who know how to stop a show. Every day this veteran diva admits to being bored by the sound of her own voice. La Streisand is also well known for suffering from stage fright and having a strong aversion to singing live. So, on the rare occasions that Babs can be persuaded to go out on the road, she understandably feels justified in charging like a wounded bull. In 1994, the price of tickets to her first concert tour in 27 years topped out at 1,500 US dollars. Despite the exorbitant tag, the entire tour was sold out in under an hour, making her the highest paid concert performer in history. Twelve years later, at the age of 64, she smashed records again, grossing a staggering $92.5 million over just 20 dates in America, without any bells or whistles. It's really uh, about the music. The music and me, it's much simpler. I don't have any uh, pyrotechnics or trap doors except sort of one. But, um, no, it's, it's, it's just the music and me. Even without a sumptuous stage show, fans over in London were happy to hand over £500 a ticket. If she's worth every penny. If you get a chance to see her, go and see her. She may not be around for much longer, but at the moment, fantastic. At least this time around, a proportion of the pot was being siphoned off for worthy causes. Money for um, great charities that I believe in. You know, there's so much to be done in the world today and certainly even medical research for women and fighting against nuclear proliferation, global warming. Um, so many good things to do in the world that uh, I have to raise money, you know? Just call me a charity. Indeed, it's fair to say that the Emmy, Grammy, Oscar and Tony Award winner has always done her bit for charity. A political activist from way back, her fundraising efforts in the early 90s helped propel Bill Clinton into the spotlight and into the White House. She was also involved in efforts to get more effective aid to New Orleans in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. Undoubtedly one of the world's biggest gay icons, she's also prepared to put her mouth where her money is on the issue of gay marriage. Whether you're a heterosexual couple or, you know, same-gender couple, Everybody has the right to love and be loved. That's what's important, to strengthen families, whether they're gay families, heterosexual families. It's about commitment and a sense of obligation. And um, to strengthen society, you have to strengthen the family. Well, there are all different kinds of families these days, right? Family for Barbara these days consists of her son Jason from her first marriage to actor Elliot Gould and her second husband James Brolin. She also plays stepmom to James' two sons, Josh and Jesse. Born in Brooklyn in 1942, she shares a birthday with actress Shirley MacLaine and the pair have made a habit out of celebrating their big day together. Between them, they've enjoyed more than a century in the spotlight. Barbara's career kicked off in a gay bar in Manhattan's Greenwich Village in 1960. Three years later, she was opening for Liberace in Las Vegas. By the end of the following year, she'd proved that she was not only the last of the great belters as christened by Judy Garland, but that she could also act. Her starring role on Broadway as Fanny Bryce in Funny Girl was turned into Hollywood gold in 1968. Hello, gorgeous. She won an Oscar for nailing the same part in the big screen version. You know, if Several more show, film roles followed, I think but the all-conquering Babs was soon on the lookout for even bigger challenges. <laughs> and in 1972, oh, she set up her own production company, Barwood Films, and began producing her own movies. Where is it written? Never mind where, it's a law. Well, it's in 1983, she raised the bar even higher by writing, directing, producing, and starring in Yentl. It received five Oscar nominations and was declared a masterpiece by Steven Spielberg. Hello! 
I'm Roz. In 2004, she returned to acting after an eight-year hiatus to play Ben Stiller's mother in the much-anticipated sequel to the comedy blockbuster Meet the Parents. The need to prove to herself she could still act was just one of her reasons for saying yes to Meet the Fockers. It was time to be funny and they just really wanted me to be in it. And it was Ben wanted to be his mom and Jay wanted to direct me. And I just thought, what the hell? You know, I didn't have to work five days a week, so it wasn't. Good experience. Following in Barbara's footsteps in more ways than one, pint-sized rocker Pink is partial to using her profile to bring attention to social and humanitarian issues. In 2006, the two-time Grammy winner blasted fellow singer Beyonce for wearing fur. Later that year, she joined with animal rights organization PETA to launch a wall boycott in Paris in protest over the practice of mulesing in Australia. Two years later, she got behind the campaign to end cruelty to horses in New York City. The goal is to have horse-drawn carriages completely banned in New York City, just like Tokyo and Beijing and Paris and London and Toronto and Key West and Santa Fe. It's already banned in all those cities. I want New York to step up and, and completely rid itself of this outdated, awful, cruel tradition. For Pink, the ability to turn the spotlight on important social issues comes with the privilege of being a celebrity. Uh, someone likes your music or likes what you do, um, or knows that you have a tendency of f***ing people off, they'll want to know, what's she doing this time? So whether they agree with it or not, they'll have an awareness, oh, I didn't even think about that. Oh, I didn't even think that would be cruel. The feisty filly from Pennsylvania was born Alicia Beth Moore. Her Vietnam veteran dad, Jim, sang songs and played guitar, instilling her with an early love of music. She also inherited Jim's penchant for partying. But even though her nurse mother may have despaired of the wild teenager who tried heroin and had a lesbian lover before she was 16, Pink always believed she would be a star. I always said I was going to do it, and they just didn't believe me. And, and my mom sometimes is like, I can't believe that you made this all happen. Like, yeah, I told you so. I was By the age of 22, she'd already released two hit solo albums, won a Granny Award, and built a reputation for being one of the toughest women in pop. So why the sappy name? When the Reservoir Do Dogs movie came out with Quentin Tarantino, Mr. Pink is like the smart, sassy, smart-ass kind of guy and with the attitude, and me and all my friends were sitting around, we all kind of just dubbed each other. And they picked me for Mr. Pink. She's defined herself as trisexual, on account of finding just about everyone attractive, which is music to the ears of both her male and female fans, especially since her divorce from motocross racer Carrie Hart. She cited their busy careers for the reason behind the split, but perhaps at the age of 29, she wasn't ready to settle down. I mean, I look at my dogs as my kids, and I'm no better at discipline than my mom was, so... My dogs walk all over me the same way my, I walked all over my mom. It's good. It's really reassuring. I think it's a great response. It's a responsibility to yourself first, who you want to be as a person before you can be a parent or as you're becoming a parent. Another thing she may have to consider before rushing into motherhood is giving up the death-defying stage stunts. For her I'm Not Dead tour, she rolled out some pretty spectacular circus tricks, including performing acrobatics while suspended meters above the stage in silk. I don't like anything that's not dangerous. So there's definite danger. Um, we had to change out our motors because they broke and I got hogtied in the air at about 30 feet. That wasn't fun. <laughs> Night number two. Um, it's fun. It's, I mean, it's, it's fun especially when you can scare the crap out of everyone that's working on the tour every night. Makes you feel good. <laughs> Celine Dion may never have found herself dangling hogtied mid-performance, but the celebrated Canadian songstress is certainly no stranger to spectacular stage shows. In fact, during her 600-show contract at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, she flew over the crowd on a nightly basis, thanks to the extravagant imagination of Cirque du Soleil's Franco Dragone. 
Despite the equally extravagant ticket price, the show was sold out almost every night of its record-breaking run, which was extended by more than a year. After a gruelling five years, the show closed in December 2007. The thing is, if, you know, if I do stop after Vegas, it's going to be very difficult for me because it's already starting to be hard to say goodbye to that show and the cast and the crew and the people. Five years of spending amazing moments together. Already a star in the French-speaking world in the 1980s, it took Celine Dion another two years to master English and to begin her assault on the US charts. Her breakthrough came with the title track to Disney's 1991 animated feature Beauty and the Beast. And from there, she's gone on to wedge herself into the public consciousness as one of the world's top-rated songbirds. Unlike many of her more fragile peers, she's managed to steer well clear of any scandal or intrigue. To date, the most shocking revelations to emerge about her private life came with the 1993 announcement that she was in love with her manager, René Angelil, who was 26 years her senior. The couple married in a lavish ceremony the following year. And in 2000, Celine took a break from singing in order to start a family with René, who had recently been diagnosed with throat cancer. After undergoing fertility treatment, she was thrilled to give birth to their son, René Charles. I have met life not too, too long ago, which represented a new day for me. I have sung it, I have given birth, and that was a new day. Throughout her career, Celine's Yoda-like English, sentimental singing style and melodramatic facial expressions have been the target of frequent parody, which just seems to roll off the singer's back as she laughs all the way to the bank. Her contract with Caesar's Palace has been praised as one of the smartest decisions a performer has ever made. When the show finally closed at the end of 2007, she was revving up the tour bus to promote her first all-new English studio album. Las Vegas was such an amazing journey, but I was away from the industry for five years. Even though I was working on stage every night, I was away from the industry in a way. So for me to come back with a new album, introducing it through as well, a TV special, just before hitting the road again, we never stop, but it's great. In an attempt to shake off the staid middle of the road image, her latest effort features collaborations with Josh Groban and the Black Eyed Peas' Will I Am. She's also been busting a few moves. I always loved dancing a lot very much, but um, I, think, I, I think I didn't do before because I think with time you feel more secure about yourself. I don't have to prove. It, what, what if I dance and I don't do it right? I'm, I'm not a dancer to start with and I can make mistakes. I just, just want to enjoy myself. But when you, when you mature, you just want to enjoy, you don't feel like proving to yourself, you just want to do it and have a good time. As well as playing mother and megastar, she's also been finding the time to branch out into other areas. Her relationship with Fragrance House Coty has just yielded its fifth Celine Dion perfume. And while she was working in Vegas, she joined forces with children's photographer Anne Getty to produce a collection of love songs, lullabies and images to honour the bond between a mother and baby. A privilege, an honour, a blessing. They're so powerful, so fragile, but so... It's like they know, they know everything. Working closely with babies naturally turns Celine to thoughts of having a second child. But as she stares down the barrel of the big 4-0, she's got plenty of other things on the agenda. I'm keeping the best, you know. The, when you say the best is yet to come, I can't show it all at, in one number. You know, in my 20s, I showed certain things. In my 30s, others. I'm going to be 40 years of age, I tell you. You better buckle up. Five years older than Celine, Whitney Houston has mixed feelings about being labelled a diva. It's a very, very funny word. It can mean prima donna or goddess. You know, any given day you can be the or. I don't know. I, I, I'm just, um, I'm Whitney. If diva is the word, and if that's what I am, and if I'm at the top of my class, if I'm the number one diva, I'm fine. If I've got to be number two, I ain't cool with it. 
The Guinness Book of Records calls her the most awarded female artist of all time. By the age of 22, she was already a millionaire. But then she did start early. At 11, she was performing solos in the local choir alongside her gospel singing mother, Sissy. With Dionne Warwick as an aunt and Aretha Franklin as a godmother, she didn't have to look far for guidance and inspiration. She signed a recording contract with Arista Records at the age of 19 and went on to release the biggest selling debut album of all time. The Greatest Love of All sat on top of the Billboard 200 album chart for 14 consecutive weeks. Her second album, Whitney, was another smash, but many black critics complained that her music was too white, while others slammed her for her conservative song choice and good girl image. She put well paid to the latter in 1990, when she hooked up with bad boy new edition singer Bobby Brown, who had already built up a tidy police record as well as racking up three children with three different women. They were married in 1992, and Whitney gave birth to their daughter Bobby Christina the following year. She then made her big screen acting debut in the hugely successful film The Bodyguard opposite Kevin Costner. She followed up with a few more film roles, and for her role in the comedy The Preacher's Wife, she won an NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Actress. At the height of her success in 1994, she went on a concert tour of South Africa as the first overseas artist to perform in the apartheid-free country. During the tour, she donated $1 million to South African children's charities, prompting then-President Nelson Mandela to make a glowing speech. Uh, merely to clean, to polish her shoes. No, no. And, uh, no. She is one of the price, uh, priceless jewels of the anti-apartheid struggle. They will love her so much. It was all a bit much for the emotional star, whose personal life was becoming the subject of increased speculation, thanks to her erratic behavior and dazed public appearances. She started turning up late for photo shoots and recording sessions, as well as canceling concerts and interviews. Whether she liked the diva tag or not, it stuck. When she did turn up for shows, her shockingly skeletal frame had commentators worrying about her mental and physical health. In early 2000, she and Bobby were found to be carrying half an ounce of marijuana at Hawaii airport. Two months later, Whitney turned up late and mumbling incoherently to rehearsals for the Academy Awards and was unceremoniously sacked by Burt Bacharach. While those around her tried to keep up appearances, Whitney continued to ring alarm bells. On the Diane Sawyer show in 2002, she famously answered questions about the drug rumors by claiming she made too much money to smoke a cheap drug like crack and declaring crack is whack. Meanwhile, Bobby was piling up the sexual harassment, drink driving and assault charges. And in 2003, he was arrested for misdemeanor battery after allegedly beating Whitney. The year after, he did a stint in a Georgia jail. Whitney's own spiraling drug abuse led to a trip to rehab, although she checked herself out after only five days, claiming she felt claustrophobic. But through it all, she stuck by Bobby's side, even enduring the invasion of TV cameras for a reality show called Being Bobby Brown. And by 2006, she was in rehab again. This time, she stayed the course and finally filed for separation from Bobby. Their divorce went through six months later, with Whitney winning full custody of Bobby Christina and heading straight back to the studio. Her nearest and dearest insisted her life and career were finally back on track. She's doing great. <laughs> and she's in the studio recording. We've just finished a family project with my entire family, inclusive of her, on a song called Family Comes First and she's singing brilliantly. Of course, she looks fabulous. What more do you want to know? If a diva's worth is measured in personal tragedy, the greatest living example has to be Liza Minnelli. She was just 22 when her mother's lifelong dependency on prescription medication ended in her death of an overdose on a bathroom floor at the age of 47. 
Growing up in the shadow of a legend bent on self-destruction, she often had to look after her mother and her younger siblings. She also became the victim of Judy Garland's paralyzing paranoia, which prevented her from truly supporting Liza's singing ambitions. One of Liza's greatest regrets is that Judy never got to see the film that launched her career. 1972's Cabaret won her the year's Academy Award for Best Actress. Despite all the heartache, Liza still clearly idolizes Judy. I love my mother like crazy. She's my guardian angel. With guardian angels like Judy Garland, who needs demons? But for the first few years after that, Liza's career enjoyed plenty of highs with acclaimed concerts at Radio City Music Hall and a number of film credits, including starring opposite Robert De Niro in New York, New York, and opposite Dudley Moore in the 1981 comedy Arthur. Her love life, meanwhile, showed plenty of instability, with three marriages and two broken engagements that ended in a vow never to walk down the aisle again. Towards the late 70s, it became clear that she had inherited her mother's predilection for prescription medicines, as well as her ability to belt out a show-stopping tune. In between trips to rehab in the 90s, she set about relaunching her yo-yoing career by taking over from Julie Andrews in the Broadway show Victor Victoria. In the year 2000, she was floored by a serious case of viral encephalitis, which left her in a wheelchair. But a battler from way back, she found strength in the new man in her life, producer and concert promoter David Guest. Well, I lost a lot of weight, uh, and it helps me, you know, because I have a bad back. The thinner I stay, the better I feel. So, um, and also, David inspired me, you know. So, I, wanted, I want to, uh, I want to work, I want to laugh, I want to have fun. You know, everything's been a bit serious before. <laughs> Not only did he get her out of the wheelchair and back on the concert trail, the long-term bachelor and collector of Judy Garland memorabilia persuaded her to break her vow of celibacy. I was on the roof and I thought, wonder who and what's happening. And all of a sudden, <laughs> I turned around, I looked for David, I went like this because he's on his, his knee. And okay, he well... asked me and I said, yes. Their $3.5 million New York nuptials still stand as the most expensive in show business. In fact, they were probably still paying off the caterers when the announcement came of a split a year later. David claimed Liza had given him herpes, while she labelled him a drug addict. Then came David's shock allegations that Liza had repeatedly abused him. You, how are you coping with the allegations of spousal abuse that we've seen in the newspapers the past few days? Pardon me? How are, you co how are you coping with the allegations that have been in the newspapers the last couple of days? I think she's doing great. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm fine. So what's your reaction to them, though? Well, you know, I called my friend Yossi, and I said, Yossi, I, you won't believe what's being said, and this, that, and the other. And he said, darling, let's go out and have a nice evening. And uh, people know me. They know me. They why, do. Why do you think that he's done this then? Oh, darling, I can't tell you that. You have to ask him. But then smiling through the pain has been Liza's trademark ever since she first belted out maybe this time. That number has become almost as much of a signature song for her as Over the Rainbow was for her mother. More than 35 years on, she still gives it everything she's got.